Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Brenna Moore, and I am a board member at LSA Family Health Service. For over 60 years, LSA has been one of East Harlem's most important institutional anchors. It's the cornerstone, it's a cornerstone of the East Harlem community and a trusted partner to thousands of families that rely on our services. And I'm also a professor of theology at Fordham University in the Bronx. And at Fordham, we're committed to teaching and research guided by the principles of service and solidarity with the vulnerable, the search for truth, uh, and a passion for justice. And I often tell my own students and my colleagues that it truly is difficult to find another community organization in New York that embodies these ideals more than LSA. We talk a lot in, you know, in my classes, we talk a lot about solidarity, not as a concept, but something grounded in real actual relationships that aim to empower, not only to serve. And LSA is a community organization fueled by long standing, deep relationships with the families in East Harlem, um, serving and empowering them to live lives of dignity and working to create really lasting change for a more humane and equitable and just society. And LSA, as some of you know, was founded by the Little Sisters of the, Insu the Assumption, an order of nuns in Paris in 1865, with a mission to be present among the poor, the workers, and their families. And for over 150 years, the Little Sisters have done this sort of in small communities really all over the world, including in East Harlem beginning in the late 1950s. And the women who founded LSA are among the countless communities of Catholic women religious or nuns who have responded in really distinctive ways to pressing social issues around the world for, for hundreds of years. And this is the kind of the part of the Catholic church, more about deeds than words, and it gets much, much less press than the church hierarchy. Um, but it's where, I think it's where the ideals of courageous engagement with vulnerable members of our society have always been made real. And today we'll hear from the staff members who are taking up LSA's mission today and particularly shepherding the organization through the tumultuous past year and a half. And of course, over a year ago, our world turned upside down and we were all so deeply affected by the pandemic. But of course, some communities suffered so much more than others, including LSA's East Harlem neighborhood. As of September 2020, um, the death rate of East Harlem's residents is 35% higher than the rest of New York City. And this is according to, to data released by the city's health department. So 35% higher. And today we wanna share a bit about how your support enabled LSA to remain open and providing robust services for all but the very two weeks of the crisis. So right away, um, LSA was present once again in the community in the time of emergency. And we also wanna talk a bit about today, how we plan to move forward to address the inequities and the challenges that have really been exposed and amplified in the pandemic. And before we start, before we get into these, we get into things, I want to just draw your attention to a recent 60 Minutes interview with Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation. So we're not going to play it, but we're going to put it in the chat um, for you to reference. It's worth watching. And in it, he talks about philanthropy today and what he views as a new approach to, philan to philanthropy that's needed to really address the deep, deep inequities that are the cause of so much of what we're experiencing and grappling with now. And um, the link to the interview in the chat, I think, I think is gonna help, um, help give you a little bit sense of what this new model of philanthropy will look like. But at LSA, you know, we really think that we have been, I think ahead of the curve and in a bet on this new model of philanthropy working at um, both the levels of direct service, but really also more, more importantly, direct addressing the real causes of structural inequality. Um, and a few, just a couple of very brief housekeeping items to note before we get started in our conversation. So all participants have been placed on mute, but we'll have, we've allowed a few minutes at the end of our conversation for questions. And if you have a question, please send it to us um, via the Q&A chat that's right at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll answer questions at the end of the discussion. And if we have too many questions, we'll follow up with you after. And so I'm 
begin by introducing you to tonight's panelists. Maybe our panelists can, can wave as I introduce you. So first we have Rita Edelstein, the CEO of LSA. She's our chief executive officer. Um, Rita has an extensive background in, in nonprofit world. She first joined LSA in 2014 as our chief development and communications officer, becoming CEO in 2016. Rita holds a Master of Social Work and has done post-master's training at the Ackerman Institute for Family Therapy. So thanks, Rita. And then next we have Monica Sanchez, our Director of Mental Health Services. Monica is a licensed creative art therapist and is art therapy registered and board certified. And for the past six and a half years, she's developed the Mental Health Services Program at LSA where she directs the program. And her work is trauma-focused and provides holistic therapeutic interventions for immigrant women and their families. And then next we have Melina, Melina Gonzalez here with us. She's our community engagement manager and our immigration outreach coordinator. Melina joined LSA Family Health Service in, um, in 2003, 2003. She manages community engagement with our East Harlem partners and our immigration outreach efforts. Melina also works with the mayor's office in the city of the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, and she periodically visits detention centers at the border and works as a translator there with attorneys representing immigrant children and their families. Um, and then finally with us, we have Ray, Ray Lopez, our director of programs and the director of the environmental health and family asthma program. Um, and Ray oversees all of LSA's program. And Ray lives in East Harlem and has very deep firsthand knowledge of the community's needs. He's also a leader with the Metro Industrial Area Foundation's um, group Manhattan Together. And they played a critical role in achieving a landmark federal court settlement with the New York City Housing Authority, which aims to protect residents exposed to mold conditions that exacerbate asthma. So thank you so much panelists for joining us tonight. I'm looking forward to a great conversation. And I'm gonna begin our discussion with a question for Ray. So Ray, I'm gonna begin with you. So what would you say are the biggest program accomplishments and successes since the pandemic started? Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to the event. Uh, well, we knew that when the pandemic hit, LSA services would be more important than ever. And the first major accomplishment was getting our food pantry reopened two weeks after the, the shutdown of the city. Um, and the, the advocacy and food pantry staff with support from our nurses who provided expertise and connected us to new partners, uh, enabled us to reopen our doors. Uh, the second major accomplishment I think was what the rest of the teams had to do to pivot to virtual services while maintaining uh, engagement with families. Uh, the direct service staff suspended regular services and they just maintained contact with the families. Initially, they made sure to listen um, to the, the family struggles and needs and tried to connect them to services. Uh, the direct service staff learned that families needed the basics, food, financial support, information on how to mitigate uh, or reduce uh, exposure to COVID-19, protect family members, and just someone to talk to. And staff, they really demonstrated deep empathy flexibility, resourcefulness, really in line with LSA's missions and mission and values. Uh, the, ex the experience led us to launch uh, an emergency cash assistance program with generous support of individuals, foundations, and partner organizations. And to date, we've provided more than $100,000 to 200 families. And we have 60,000 and counting uh, more uh, to distribute. I think those Thanks are the, so the, the two biggest accomplishments. There are many more, but. Right, I know. I mean, it's amazing how quickly you guys sort of just went right into action mode. I think we were all quite astounded. Um, and I wanna you know, ask a follow-up question to what you've talked about, Ray, to Melina. So Melina, Ray just mentioned the additional reliance on the community during the pandemic. Can you talk with us a little bit about how your relationships with other community uh, leaders, organizations, how are they helping the clients um, of LSA? 
Thank you, Rana. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So when everything closed last year, we knew we need additional support to ensure the services were still available for our LSA clients. Our community came together and we understood the importance of partnerships. Some of our local restaurants such as Barcha, Tacombi and Tacomix provided thousands of meals for our community. These meals were essential for families who were affected by COVID and for our seniors who were by themselves at home. Our friends of Randall's Island Farm contribute with about thousand pounds of fresh organic products for our food pantry on the season 2020. And I'm really happy and excited to report you that we're gonna start a new season. This Wednesday, May 12th, we're going to receive our first delivery of organic products. That means that our community will be able to enjoy it again, these are fresh products. When online learning became the new norm, our families didn't have the equipment that they need. So Town Village Synagogue and our longtime partner coming at the Sacred Heart School provided with over 60 laptops so to ensure that our children were not left behind. And more now than ever, with more learning, this was an essential need. This, pa this past holiday season, our partners of San Agustin Church donated over 300 coats and more than 500 toys for our LSA children. Robin Hood donated 100 gift cards for our teenagers. In Bank of Canada, one of our new partners just recently continues supporting us and they contribute with winter coats, Easter baskets. These donations made a huge difference, especially in this dark holiday season. Our friends at Church of Heavenly Rest have created COVID-friendly outdoor events. So more of over 250 families, that means maybe 200 to 300 kids have received outdoor events in a secure uh, COVID environment. This is an essential need for our families to be outside spending quality time as a family. With our partners of CUNY Citizenship, Legal Aid and Action NYC, we have been able to provide over 200 uh, virtual free consultations with our immigration lawyers. But none of this would be happening if we, we don't have the partnership. Our partners are essential for our mission. We cannot do this with our partners. No matter how big or how small you are, you are essential for these families. If you wanna learn more about our partnerships or if you wanna become one, please feel free to contact me. I would love to grow our network and continue serving our community in these desperate times. Thank you. Thanks, Melina. Those are incredible examples and I think really show the range of LSA's relationships and, and work. I mean, both the like the legal, the, the legal aid work and the holiday service and the organic food, not to mention the sort of the like emergency cash assistance that that Ray mentioned. Those are wonderful examples of the community of East Harlem coming together. Melina, thank you so much. So let's move on to Monica. So Monica, going to you, you know, we have seen the mental health toll that this crisis has created. Um, LSA provides mental health services for its community and these services um, that you help oversee, they're free, they're bilingual, and they're offered through individual and group therapy. And I know you also offer parent-child art therapy sessions. So can you tell us a little bit more about what are some of the unique mental health issues surrounding the pandemic in particular, and how has LSA helped its community around, around that category? <clears throat> Hi, uh, Brenda and everyone. Uh, um, yes, I can talk about, you know, how um, the mental health program at LSA who has been, have been working for more than around six and a half years is really based on the LSA mission, what we believe that the growth is in the relationship. So we start for that from there. Um, the program um, has is, is, is a, it's a trauma-informed care program. It's a holistic approach. It's tailored to our clients, um, the clients of LSAID. Um, we use a combination of art therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and psychodynamics um, approaches. And what we do here is that art therapy helps these clients because many of these clients don't speak English or Spanish. And now that we're providing services for the children, they don't have sometimes the language. So our therapy is essential to really do the trauma-informed 
um, we are based in, and in, in, in really we are uh, committed to provide based research and based, best intervention practice. Um, our clients are childbearing age women with sustained trauma and the families. Um, so our therapy increased self-awareness, helping coping with the skills and with the stress of trauma experiences and enhance cognitive abilities. So during the pandemic um, in March, 2020, uh, when the COVID-19 begins, we adapted very quickly to uh, telehealth. So we start having video and phone sessions with our clients and supporting. Uh, and something that we did also is that we create virtual, uh, virtual groups and these virtual groups become very essential for what was happening because we were able to have, I was able to have in the mental health department reach 40 clients because we create WhatsApp groups. So these groups help us to what happened at the beginning of the pandemic is when little sister came all together to really work and help the clients with what's happening right now. Um, so clients have this space and we have the communication with all the teams to help them with diapers, to help them with, um, you know, cash assistance, food, and of course, the emotional support. Um, it has been very challenging, but it has been an opportunity to reach clients everywhere in New York. We have clients from Brooklyn, from Queens, uh, from the Bronx. Um, we also adapt really processing the trauma, clients continue talking, these groups were uh, formed to help with the feelings of isolation, depression and anxiety, and really to teach clients about trauma and that we were all going through grief and loss at this time. So we want the community to feel a sense of belonging and a sense that we are still are here. And it has been very, very powerful. We were able to provide in 220, 767 sessions. The increase uh, to support mothers and child when art therapy has been really important because children has been affected by this pandemic more than, you know, <laughs> and so it has been really hard for that. Uh, so we are, we're glad that we're able to do this in person. I'm also part of the community. So we're able to, I'm close to the agency. So we're able to coordinate really the art therapy part that is really giving clients, um, not only given the space, but also given elements that help them to really process. Um, we also create a group, um, a summer group, a special summer group. Um, to continue, um, you know, communication and co coordination. Um, and right now we have, the increase has been really intense. Uh, we have seen severe cases of domestic violence and we have been able to support clients just to be there and listen because bigger agencies are closed or are at the beginning and now there are still some agencies are just going back to in person. So it's taking longer. So we have been able to, to really um, support clients with profound histories of domestic violence. Another thing that we observe is that we have to go, we have, have an increase of going to the ER with clients in crisis. So our, our, our clients, um, already have a lot of issues. And so this crisis is really skyrocketing what is happening. So a lot of visits because, you know, crisis with um, increase of anxiety, depression, and also stress. Many of our families lost their job um, and they were really, really affected for this. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to, oh yes, um, sorry. <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to, um, to say is that I feel that in this pandemic, Little Sister came together and we really grew as a team and as an agency. And we are all so committed to our, our community and to serve the community. And it was, even though it's a very sad and, 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 and um, and difficult and challenging time, it was also very exciting to see all of us working together the way we did. Um, so, you know, thank you. And thank you to all the supporters. We will not be able to make it without you. And, you know, thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. I can't believe those statistics that you showed us that you guys provided 767 sessions, um, therapy sessions during the pandemic. That's incredible. And just the range, you know, of the LSA, the, the work that LSA does. I mean, those are such tough issues, but it sounds like you were able to move 
things virtually incredibly effectively. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's incredible. That is such important and overlooked uh, service to our community. Um, so thank you. And uh, my, my next question, I'd like to turn to Rita um, before we close. So Rita, so from March, 2020 to this March, so if we look at like the whole pandemic year, LSA has actually fed more than 21,000 families. And that's a huge increase in the number of families um, during normal times at LSA. In fact, almost nearly all of LSA's programs have in fact grown during this time. Can you tell us about the building changes that are taking place to accommodate LSA's really growing needs mm -hmm. and a little bit more about your plans for, uh, for LSA going forward? Absolutely. But before I go into that, number one, I want to say to everybody, you haven't even heard about parent and child development, nursing, after school enrichment, and the thrift shop, which are also ma major programs uh, in, their, in their own right and do just as much in many, many ways as, as the ones you've heard about here. I also really want to just acknowledge the staff, not only the ones that are on this panel, but every single member from the facility staff, which really are the heroes who kept the building open, to, uh, you know, to Molina and Ray and Lawrence, our, our chief finance and chief operating officer, to everybody down the line. It's, I, I must acknowledge everybody's work. It never would have happened without this incredible staff that, that we have. Um, so now to the, the building. Uh, pretty much everything, I think, Brenda, you might have mentioned this in the beginning, pretty much everything we do is in response to, to, to community need. Uh, you know, and so, and that includes the building renovations. What started, you know, as an effort to be COVID compliant, you know, changes to the HVAC and other, other things, uh, during the engineers looking at all of that, we realized that we had to adjust the facility to the needs, that the needs were enormous. We have this one building uh, and, and we had to figure out how do we accommodate the building so that we can meet as many of these the needs as, as possible. So, and the other thing we realized during the course of it is we have an almost 20 year old building, which of course is our greatest asset. So there was not only the need to adjust the building to the needs of the community, but also to protect this major asset of LSAs in terms of upkeep and wear and tear and repair. So the, the first thing that we thought was critical besides the HVAC, of course, was food. So we are going to be enlarging the food pantry. Uh, so right now we've been using the thrift store to package food and, and the lobby and all kinds of spaces to, to, to be able to provide food to, to, to the community. So we're going to be enlarging the pantry so that we can do that without overturning the thrift shop and the lobby and, you know, and half of the first floor. Uh, then, of course, there's the mental health needs that Monica has described. And up till now, it's been kind of a scattershot throughout the building using a room here and a room there. So we are creating a dedicated mental health space up on the fourth floor, which will have some private space for one-on-one for -on -one, as well as large space for art therapy and, and groups. So that will be its own, its own discrete space that protects the privacy of people coming for, for, for mental health. Uh, early childhood, you know, that's, that's the next big, big thing for, for us. We've been doing that for a long time. The program originally was called with parenting and child development. Uh, we have applied and that, that program deals with kids zero to three, very, very early childhood. Um, uh, mostly immigrant, immigrant families. So we have applied for an early head start grant which is very similar to the model we have, which includes classroom-based socialization, home visits, uh, parent involvement, you know, casework when needed, a whole variety, nursing when needed. So we're waiting to hear, hear from the feds. We know we're in the running for it. We thought we would hear in, um, in April, but the feds are behind. <laughs> so they're just now getting to the 2020 grant. So we expect to, to hear about that. Uh, so, so those are the places, you know, we're doing some uh, upgrading the administrative 
spaces as well, since the furniture and everything else is, is 20 years, 20 years old. Um, so so that, that's basically what's happening with, with the building. Things like touchless fixtures in the bathrooms and, and all of that basic COVID stuff. Um, in terms of the future, you, you know, we could be feeding 20,000 people a day and we'd still be putting only a Band-Aid on the problem. And so, so what we're looking at is research in order to, to help develop um, systemic solutions because these are really systemic problems. Uh, the reference to that interview with Darren Rock Walker, we, we, he really talks about you know, food insecurity, uh, early childhood, the lack of early childhood uh, or education, other things like that as being systemic issues that keep people from being, they keep people in, pover, in poverty, uh, they, they, do, they do not give people equal access to, to education and a whole bunch of other disparities that, that COVID has really you know, kind of ripped the curtain, the curtain off of. So what, what we want to do is embed research in every one of our programs, which actually we've been doing for a long, long time and most people don't know about it, to embed research in every one of these programs so that we can develop best practices in the areas of our expertise you know, all of which relate to the social determinants of health, which are things like food insecurity, safe housing, community support, access to education, uh, and about you know probably four or five other key ones. So all of our programs, you know, are centered around uh, the five key social determinants of health, uh, and the research is 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 to look at those determinants, look at the solutions that that we demonstrate uh, and then roll them out, those solutions, those systemic solutions out to other organizations like ours all over the country. We also believe that good research leads to good policy. So we also think that the research component uh, will help us to be able to develop policies around these issues and have a seat at the policy table, which is where real change starts to happen. Uh, you know, so, so that's really the vision to be working with research partners so that LSA becomes an incubator for best practices and then we disseminate and provide technical assistance. So I think that's five minutes. So, but that's, that, that's the essence of, of where we want to be going, going forward. Thank you so much, Rita. And, and before we move to the q and I just wanted to say how much I appreciated hearing all, all of these stories and thinking about the building, you know, accommodating everything from kind of privacy to mental health, to thinking about ways in which the building might even accommodate these new, this new vision of incubating research. Right. Um, and, and I'll just say this briefly, you know, at Fordham, we started a research partnership with LSA this year that I had a team of graduate and undergraduate students interviewing clients about their lives and their and how LSA has impacted them and, and to what extent. And it was so great for the students. So there's so many universities in New York. And I think the thing is that they are eager to have the students do community-based research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, our students were speaking in Spanish, our students were collecting data, you know, asking interesting questions and seeing what kind of inequality and social justice, and even like going through COVID as an immigrant. I mean, you just can't no. really do that in a classroom. And it was an incredibly profound mm -hmm. educational experience. Yeah. So I think that the research component will be great for LSA, but I think kind of research institutions are really going to see that as a win-win yeah. and a kind of yeah. strength to strength partnership. So that's, well, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, here's a little interesting factoid for you. A couple of years ago, I was in Washington, DC, and I visited with some folks at HUD with whom Ray uh, LSA was involved in actually a nationwide research project. And one of the things they said to me is, I said, now why LSA, this little organization? What we have that nobody else does, according to the folks at HUD, is access to a population that is extremely difficult uh, for other organizations to access. The level of trust, given our longevity in the community, Starting, starting with with the nuns, you know, who were really caregivers, um, 
they the trust in in LSA uh, as opposed to the total lack of trust in large bureaucratic institutions is striking and so it's that access that researchers from all over the country actually need mm -hmm. that, that we can provide so I, I thought that was an interesting tidbit from HUD around Absolutely. some of this and it's so true and I think for the population that LSA serves often immigrant populations, sometimes undocumented. I mean, we hear about them all the time in our political discourse, but rarely we hear from them. I mean, what public avenues do we hear, do we have to really hear directly from those voices? But they're at LSA, you know, all the time and our, those relationships are key. And the research is key too, to help LSA not succumb to how so many social service agencies just quickly then just you know food right. bank, food bank, you know quickly just responding right. to the immediate need but to work right. on deeper structural change yeah. but we'll keep going we've got some great questions okay. um in the q a so i want the first one actually goes to ray and it actually gets to this to this issue a little bit about um i think longer term change versus immediate change i think that's what be, what's behind this mm -hmm. question are there any efforts ray at lsa to provide vocational training to shift um, from, you know, dependents from, you know, like the social service agencies. Um, so yeah, can you say anything about LSA's interest in providing vocational training to its clients? Sure. Um, so obviously we don't have a program that's dedicated to that. Um, I think uh, our programs and our organization are connected to other organizations that provide sort of that traditional uh, vocational um, education and experience. So, so we do uh, work with our partners to, to provide referral. Um, but you know, within the organization, we do have uh, some projects uh, that that are in this area and. As many of you may know, we used to uh, have uh, programming that was uh, providing uh, adult education. So, you know, helping uh, adults get their ESL certification. Um, currently, we have a few projects uh, that are focused uh, on, on exposing people to, to potential uh, vocational opportunities. One is, um, uh, you know, in, in our census project last year, uh, we um, recruited and engaged some local uh, community residents who may have been, well, some of whom were clients at Little Sisters to work alongside our outreach team. And we're trying to build a regular sort of way of, um, of engaging uh, our community to join us on specific initiatives. And so we hope to do that more often. Um, there's, there's another project um, that Melina mentioned, uh, it, and it's you know, regarding our community's access to, um, to having internet, high-speed internet to, to, in order to be connected and, um, and also to make sure that they, that they have the hardware to, to connect and, and engage uh, effectively. So, you know, we're, we're talking about um, providing adults with um, um, a course to learn the basics, basics in, in computers. And so they, they can help to make sure that they know how to connect and that they can uh, make sure that kids are able to connect. Um, and you know, through that the work of, of, of Wi-Fi access, you know, we have been thinking about that and thinking about the experiences of our, of our families and, and of the students trying to get, get connected and remain connected. Um, we've met new partners um, who may uh, provide us access to uh, to to share uh, with our community so that they can. Um, learn how to maintain a, a wireless network and gain skills in that way. I just Thank wanted to, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add to that really briefly. Many of our clients are in no shape for even vocational training, even, even the most rudimentary of, tra of trainings. They are parents who are going from, many of them, 
from food bank to food bank, trying to get enough food to feed their kids. They are parents whose kids suffer from asthma, who are home from school, you know, 65, 70 days a year. Uh, they are their intact families even before COVID. But again, um, the, 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 the fathers are, are usually working, you know, delivering our Chinese food, et cetera, et cetera. So, so a lot of what we do is to get people ready to eat, to be able to even handle basic, sort of even basic keyboard skills or, or basic, basic ESL. So there's a lot of work to be done before people are able to take advantage of opportunities like that. And a lot of what we do is on that sort of bottom, bottom rung. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I know this question wasn't directed to me, but I'll just, well, I can't resist briefly saying one thing, you know, in this research project that we're concluding, we interviewed about 20 um, mothers who were involved in the early childhood program, like 20 years ago. So they have adult kids. And the, so the immediate direct clients were mostly these mothers and babies and toddlers. And I agree, it was like emergency situation. It was like domestic violence or learn how to socialize or, or learn how to even get to a playground and, you know, just more, more kind of emergency, how to, how to have a kind of a healthy functioning, basic, basic life in East Harlem. But we were astounded of how those kids through LS, I mean, after going through so many of LSA's program, including like getting into a, a, an elementary school and so forth, have grown up, some of them with college degrees, some, but many of them like at least vocational training, but even some, you know, college and, you know, we're still kind of putting together the numbers, but we were quite shocked to hear how the adult kids ended up. And Melina is an, an incredible example of that. Melina herself and her kids. So it is, I think of LSA as almost like welcoming these families in a context of total emergency. Like imagining if you yourself had to go to another country with nothing, with nobody, and then people helping you get sorted. And then those kids have a chance, you know, go to school. And, and, and we've been, and I see that as like kind of breaking that cycle of generational poverty. Um, but that's what has surprised me the most about the research. Um, but let's keep going. We have another really good question um, that has come up that's a kind of a more of a big picture question. So perhaps we might, um, this is a question from the chat, perhaps we might go around to everyone and on the panel and give a brief statement of what has the last year taught you about the people of East Harlem? So what has it taught you about the people of East Harlem this past year we've had? Um, on my screen, I have Ray, and maybe we'll just go Ray, Melina, Monica, Rita. And just, yeah, one thing. Resourcefulness, I think, you know, um, people um, have been able to figure out how to get what they what they need. Um, you know, maybe it's not easy, but uh, we have a vibrant community, connected community. So, you know, even uh, community members who don't have relationships with our staff, they do um, have a wonderful community uh, that, that can help them find a way. And I think that, that we saw that a, a lot, you know, for people who maybe we connected with well into the, the pandemic and, and, and found that their neighbors helped them to point out, oh, you know, you could get food here, you can get tested here. And, um, you know, not all that credit goes to, to us, but I think that we uh, definitely uh, are part of that fabric of the community. Thanks, Ray. Melina? I have to say this resilience and commitment. Um, our families, yes, they suffer from so many um, injustice. But I have to say that this in these times is when we see the fam families come together. I have to inform you that 50% of our volunteers in our food pantry are community members. And that's a huge accomplishment. This family receives service from advocacy, from our immigration, from many departments, and they want to give back. They want to be present. They can help us financially, but they can give us eight hours of the day, carrying boxes, supporting our students. And I have to say that our, one of the things that I admire about all my moms, my parents and my children is their commitment to continue learning, to continue growing. Mm -hmm. 
the, how do you measure growth in our family with numbers? Something we could not be able to measure. And that's why this uh, summer, we want to create workshops like uh, Ray Lopez mentioned, little by little. We wanna teach uh, with the help in uh, Osaka Heart and um, Village Town. We have 15 laptops and 15, mom, 15 moms will be able to be able to learn computer skills, basic computer skills, so they can communicate with the teachers. So they can communicate with the doctors. So they can understand how to manage computer and learn little by little. And hopefully in the future, we will have enough funding to bring back adult education. But I have to say that I have to applaud my community for coming together, helping one to another and continue each week providing services for their community. Thank you, Melina. Thanks so much. Okay, Monica, what um, about you? <laughs> I have so many examples of resilience and really these uh, clients who are really amazing. Um, and as Melina said, I have the, you know, one of the clients, not only she has COVID-19, the agency was able to help her with so many resources. Uh, we have to understand where we clients live and really already the social structure limitations that we have in the neighborhood. And clients who had been positive COVID, went to the hospital, came and get support, are going back to help and our volunteers. So I think that shows so much about how really we are counting in each other and we know that we are together in this. So I think that um, sense of, I really wanted to do something for little sisters because little sister, it's my home. As many clients say that. So it's yeah. a really a strong community and I'm part of East Harlem. So I think we're here strong uh, and surviving. That's amazing. Thank you, Monica. Okay, Rita, and then we'll do one more question. If you want to just say one thing you've learned from the community about the community this past well, year. Well, the one thing I've learned about the community of LSA, which is the community I'm going to refer to right now, is that it is absolutely incredible. I, I in my, you know, I've been around a long time. I've been a nonprofit my whole life. I've never met a staff like this one, you know, to, to step up the way they did, you know, uh, it is just, it really, it makes me want to cry. The same for the volunteers and the same for the donors. You know, many of you who are online here listening to me tonight, you know, your support and that of others was just incredible. You know, I don't think LSA has ever seen an outpouring of support like the one we did last year to buy food, to make sure that our nurses were able to get into homes, to, to make sure not just the kids had laptops, as Molina said, but the parents had laptops. This was all you know, out of the LSA staff with the support of the board and the support of donors like you. And so what I learned is that the people within the LSA community are just extraordinary. And I don't even know how to say thank you enough. That's what I learned. Yeah, that's wonderful. I would so agree. I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of emceeing, so I don't need to answer all the questions, but I just can't resist that. I think that that is the unique thing that I have seen at LSA. And this year it was so brought home to me of how the community wants to help one another and that it is when you go to LSA, kind of the traditional hierarchies that seem to be so permanent elsewhere in our society of who has power and who doesn't and who's helping and who's getting help is all scrambled. You don't quite know who's getting served and who's volunteering and who's working there. And sometimes that even changes because I've been to different, I've you know been at different parts of LSA, the office right. parts and the kind of on the ground and met with right. clients. And it is, it does that hierarchy is, is scrambled at LSA in a way that I think is very rare in our society. And it's, it's quite wonderful. So I would just totally echo what you. what you all have said. So let me just move quickly. We wanna be sure um, to have time for one last question and then some concluding thoughts and we'll make sure we end right on time. Um, but this last question is for Rita. As we think about the future, I think we all have, you guys have done such a great job of saying what has been so you know, compelling about the work of LSA, 
you know, for so many decades in East Harlem, but during the pandemic, just it's an incredible amount of work and incredible amount of, of service and commitment to structural change and empowerment in the community. So what do you think LSA now needs the most in order to continue to support its clients, to continue to do? What is the thing that LSA needs the most? What would you pull? What comes to mind, Rita? Well, oh, it's always money. I mean, I, you know, I hate to be so crass, um, you know, but it's always money to provide these services. Um, you know, and, and of course, in-kind services as, as well, you know, gifts for the kids and Christmas and coats during hurricanes and, you know, all of those, those other, other things we, we do. Um, we are expanding, okay? And I think we have to expand to meet the need. We, we can't contract because the need is too great, okay? We, you know, so, so we have to find a way to increase the services in a fiscally responsible manner. So it's not just fundraising, which, you know, of course we, we do, we are, but it's things like the Early Head Start, which is a major government contract. So, so we're looking for, for, for contracts to undergird these programs. We wanna do more with, with nutrition and with food. Um, so we see lots of ways you know, that we can expand, but we want to make sure we do it responsibly. We want to make sure that we have reserves when we need them. We want to make sure that we're protecting the building as our, as our greatest asset. Um, we need the support of the community. Uh, and we need, we need people to understand that we need to tackle these problems simultaneously. You know, I say, what good is it if we have a great school, if the kid doesn't have enough to eat, and can't think and learn and, and, you know, and focus. So I think you've got to attack all of these at once. You know, people have to be healthy. They have, the kids have to be asthma free so they can get to school. They have to have good food. You know, their parents have to be able to negotiate the school and on and on and on. And this is all of the things that we are committed to doing and to continuing to do. So we need support you know, in every which way. We're very unusual in the sense that we're a smallish around a $500 million budget organization with its own building, which is there as a result of the capital campaign. We own the land. So we can't go to a landlord and say, make us COVID, you know, COVID compliant. So we have all of these kinds of, so while the building is a blessing, it is also a major responsibility that a lot of other agencies may not have. So the needs are great, but the needs are for the community. We're just a conduit, really, to, to, to get the community what, what, what it needs. So that's probably long-winded, but that's no, some that, of what that's we need. helpful. That's helpful. And I think the thing is with, you know, the, the need for financial contributions because there is the building and the community. And I think of LSA as really like a grassroots, we're talking about like a 20 block radius, right? Yes. That even if you are a check writing type of, um, you know, active citizen, but you can go there and see these people and volunteer. it's almost like it's a welcoming place because it's not this so diffuse amorphous right. organization or a policy organization. It's like, you can look at a map, it's these 20 blocks, it's this community, That's this right. building full of people. Right. And so it, even if it is the check writing, you know, right. it, it is kind of a yeah. welcome place for anyone to see and to it put is. some volunteer it's, hours it's, too. Yeah. Um, because it's just, I think it's really interesting and, and life-giving to be connected to that building and the community. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. Nobody falls through the cracks. You know, as they say, sometimes with kids in schools, they fall, fall through the cracks. No, nobody falls through the cracks at LSA. That's right. Well, thanks. That was a, that was a really great answer to that final question. And um, we just have a little over five minutes. So I'm just going to um, say a few closing words of goodbye. And I wanted to first, you know, um, thank all of you for joining us tonight and for the truly the outpouring of support um, for LSA in the past year and your help and the truly extraordinary work of the LSA staff has kept us has kept us up and running this whole year. 
But I was thinking about this the whole time tonight. I really want to especially acknowledge our own frontline workers, the facility staff who've come in every day to keep our building running and stay safe, our nurses who are visiting patients in their homes and remotely, the advocacy food pantry staff, the army of volunteers who come in every week to fill bags with food and then distribute them, the after school, the early childhood, mental health staff who connect with every single family, who connected with every single family within just days of the shutdown and continue to provide services remotely. You know, I was thinking of how much, you know, we've been reflecting just on this past year and how much the community of LSA has been through in the past year and how much need surfaced and how LSA met that need, but then also like our frontline workers experienced the pandemic too, you know, had their own kids and, you know, had probably COVID cases and all kinds of stuff. So it is like kind of, I feel sometimes overwhelmed thinking about, you know, the nurses and all of you, you know, Melina, Ray, Monica, Rita, and all the other, you know, all, so many other staff members and volunteers who also dealt with the pandemic and, and did all this. It's quite, um, it's quite amazing. And it's what a dedicated group of people. And it is with all of your help um, that they can carry on. Um, and just a couple final sentences. So we've been hearing a lot, you know, we and I know we've been thinking all of us all year about how visible the disparities in our society that have always been there, but have become, I think, so clear in the pandemic. Um, and the effect of those disparities on Black and Hispanic communities. And East Harlem is really one of the places where these disparities play out most severely. Um, so Community Board 11, which is the district that LSA is in, in its recent statement of community needs for the fiscal year 2022, um, it showed just some statistics that I think are worth kind of like, you know, pondering, you know, and in closing. Um, that 31% of East Harlem residents over the age of 25 have a bachelor's degree. So 37 um, or yeah, 31% as opposed to 61% in Manhattan. Um, and the pre-pandemic poverty um, was 24% um, below the New York City government poverty levels versus 14% in Manhattan. And just the pandemic has made all of these disparities between Manhattan and East Harlem, um, you know, so much, so much worse. And we've long known what a 2018 community health profile stated, which is that resources and opportunities are at the root of good health. So LSA is a family health service organization, but resources, opportunities are at the root of good health. These include secure jobs with benefits, affordable housing, safe neighborhoods, clean parks, accessible transportation, healthy and affordable food, healthcare, quality education. Um, and East Harlem, a significant portion of our vulnerable residents lack such resources, which are all part of the constellation of the social determinants of health. And um, I think it's just worth saying that the programs that LSA provides are really built around those social determinants of health. They include many of the needs that are articulated in the community board report, including um, that a ba balanced mental health should be affordable and available without stigma. It's incredible, I'm thinking of Monica's work there. Quality schools and early childhood education are keys to lifting young people out of poverty health programs, initiative to encourage healthy eating, exercise. Of course, we do all of this and so much more. And then every di single day, we see the resilience, courage, and strength of the people of East Harlem. And in closing, I just want to say that I often tell my students, so they're like freshmen, you know, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors in college, and it, that it can be really overwhelming as a young person to know where to begin to address the severe inequalities in our society, like where to even begin. And I think that's true for young people, but for anybody, it's totally overwhelming to think, how do you even step in to like our structures of injustice in our society? But I often just tell them that the best thing you can do is to simply begin by partnering up with somebody doing great work. 
and just ask them what's needed to support their work. And it's just a way to begin. It's a way to begin. You don't have to do this on your own. You can't do this on your own. But there's been people that have been doing this a long time and you never know what, what life will have in store for you after you make that first step. It's just a way to begin. And I personally am so grateful for LSA to LSA for welcoming me and my family in my kids now in seventh grade and third grade welcoming us in eight years ago, when I simply reached out to them like nervous like is there any way we can help just feeling like life couldn't be about just kind of why watching and witnessing injustice. We had to do something. And they so welcomed our family. And there were so many ways our family was able to get involved with LSA. And that I have learned, you know, through personal experience, but I tell my students too, that when we take those steps to partner with somebody doing good work, it's not just about a duty that we should do, but it's truly about beginning a life that is more meaningful, that is more purposeful, that's pointed in the right direction. So I just wanted to thank you all so much for joining us for your continued support. And um, thank you so much for our panelists, the incredible work that they do. We could not have been um, successful this year without you. And I'll close there and just say thank you so much again and have a wonderful night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Brana and everybody. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Hi, thank you. Everyone. Bye.